This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. While I watch your interview, because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. And I did no due diligence. Told I have something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> Over the past several decades, one of the most prominent political figures in the United States and the world has been John Kerry. He has served as senior senator from Massachusetts, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, nominee of his party for president in 2004 and as Secretary of State under President Obama. Now, under President Biden, he's serving as special envoy for climate change. I've known John Kerry for many years, had a chance recently to sit down with him and talk to him about climate change and many other issues facing the United States. I went back and looked, and very few secretaries of state in the last 100 years, or maybe ever, have really gone back into government. So why did you want to come back into government for any issue when you're, you've got eight grandchildren, you've got uh, two daughters, uh, you've got wonderful family. Why did you want to come back and, and go through this uh, terrible process we have in Washington of getting things through consensus and getting people to agree to what you want to do? Because I want those grandchildren to have a future. It's very simple. Uh, we're not in a good track right now. The world is not serious enough about reducing our emissions fast enough, David. And the result is that uh, the planet is going to continue to evolve in reaction to what we human beings are doing to it, mostly through fossil fuels. Most of the emissions that are going up nowadays into the atmosphere and are creating this increased level of uh, energy that comes from the ocean, goes into the storms, the floods, the rain, all of it is explainable, and it's all linked to the changes we are creating on the planet. So it's very simple. I wanted to come in because I think we have a real chance now to make something happen. And I think Glasgow was a major step forward in the effort to do that. So some people will urge you to run for president this most recent election. And, you know, I thought I read in the newspapers, I don't know if it's true, that you thought about it. But when Joe Biden decided to run, you decided you were not going to run against him. Well, I decided before Joe Biden decided not to run. I thought Joe Biden had a better narrative than I did, to be honest with you. And he's a great friend through many, many years. We've known each other way back into the early 1970s. And I really thought uh, he could win and was the best guy to go do the job. And I'm glad I made that and decision. And you campaigned for him? Only Joe Biden can make America lead like America again. He gets elected and he says, guess what? Can you come back and serve again? Did you say, I'm retired, I'm already doing other things, I don't want to do it, or do you say, I really want to do this? No, I was, uh, I, I was excited by the prospect. I didn't know what it would be specifically, and I think we have to sort of work out the parameters to understand exactly what the dynamics would be. But the, the idea of having a president who wanted to get back into Paris, who wanted to make this one of his top security issues, one of his top issues overall, and the idea of having a president who was going to continue to push, as he has been, to help us get something like Glasgow was exciting and is exciting. And uh, I felt super motivated about that. Jim Baker once said the best job in Washington is actually Secretary of State. So you've seen <laughs> the presidents up close. I've said that to people, okay. too. All right. So uh, you were Secretary of State for four years. It's a great job. Everybody loves it who has that job. But now you work in the building where you were Secretary of State but you're technically not the Secretary of State anymore. Not that... technically, man. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> All right. So is it complicated? The man who was your deputy is now the Secretary no. of State. That's no, it... it's spectacular. Works out Tony okay. Tony is a great friend. I've known him for years. We, we worked on the Foreign Relations Committee okay. together, worked when he was in the White House. Uh, he's doing a great job. I think the administration is right on track now with respect to what's happening in Ukraine. Okay. I think they've been strong and skillful. And I'm very happy doing one issue, believe me. Okay, so let's talk about Glasgow. Now, many times when you have international conferences, most of the things are worked out in advance, and it's kind of, you know, summitry is worked out in advance, and you have press conferences for the things that are already agreed to. But it, my impression is in Paris and Glasgow, it wasn't all worked out in advance. can't be all worked out in advance. And, you know, nations have different interests. You have 195 nations coming to the table. 
and everybody's voice needs to be accounted for and listened to and factored into what you're doing. And some of the dynamics just don't come together until the clock strikes midnight and you know you got to cut, you know, fish or cut bait. And they're always last minute things that rise uh, in that context. So I understand from people who were in Glasgow, I wasn't there, that you were running around in the middle of the night working with other delegations trying to cut deals and in the end people actually said it was a pretty good agreement that came out of Glasgow. Is that your, it's, uh, your view as well? Yes, I think it was a very forward-leaning, strong agreement, David. Uh, it has the single greatest raising of ambition that this process has ever achieved. It has unanimity about what has to happen in terms of raising the efforts around the world. Uh, we signed on together with the plans individual nations have. And when you tie those to the initiatives that many different countries came together to embark on themselves, all together, Fatih Birol of the International Energy Agency has run the models and all of those promises. It actually could get us to hold 1.8 degrees by 2050. Now that's encouraging. It means you can do things that make a difference, at least in the models. The trick now, not a trick, the, the challenge now is that over the course of the next eight years, we have to reduce emissions by at least 45% globally in order to be able to achieve net zero by 2050 and in order to be able to hold the temperature to 1.5 degrees of warming. So uh, the consensus seems to be that you can't do these things overnight, so it, you have a period of time, you allow people to change their habits, and so the consensus is that by 2050 is the time we want to measure success, is that right? Yes, but this is not a politically arrived at or ideologically arrived at goal. This is coming from thousands of scientists. They're the ones who tell us in the last report of 2018 that if we want to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis, we have to reduce our emissions and get to net zero by 2050. The only way to get to net zero by 2050 is to begin now to reduce, because there's no curve steep enough to reduce later. You've got to start now. That's why the next eight years, this decade, those scientists have said to us, to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis, you must reduce the emissions by 45% over the next 10 years. That's 2020 to 2030. So we've set our, our goal. President Biden has set a goal that we will reduce our emissions by 50 to 52% over these next eight years. In Canada, it's about 45 to 50. Japan, 45 to 50. Europe, 55% reduction. UK, 68% reduction. South Africa, 50-some. So... People have stepped up. We now have 65% of global GDP committed to hold on to the 1.5 degrees. But that means, obviously, you have 35% that isn't. So our, our effort now, David, is called Implementation Plus. We want to implement the promises that were made in Glasgow, and we want to add to them to bring that other 35% of the people to the table. If everybody does what we said we would do currently, currently, that's without eight or nine countries that would make an enormous difference to this, but currently they say we could get to 1.8 degrees by 2050. That's pretty amazing. And, and if we can do that without China, India, Russia, Indonesia, Mexico, uh, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, a group of countries, we need them to come aboard if we get everybody on board, we could actually keep 1.5 degrees alive or minimize the damage that is done. So the countries you mentioned, they haven't signed on to this yet completely. They've signed on to various efforts. I mean, China does have a plan in place. Uh, it's just that it doesn't, in our judgment, 
we need to go further faster and and that judgment is is reinforced right. by the judgment of the International Energy Agency that says last year coal went up 9% over where we were in 2021 in, in 2020 around the world around the world what, but the US went up too didn't it it went up here too yes there was a tick up in addition uh, there's about 300 gigawatts of new coal construction coming online at a time where the International Energy Agency says you've got to reduce coal plants by 870 gigawatts. So the imbalance of that okay. is dangerous for everybody. It's at the heart of what we have to really try to tackle now. One of the challenges has been the developing nations, and some people would say China, even though it's a gigantic economy, is a developing nation, and India, a gigantic economy, a developing nation. They say, well, you guys in the West, you've been polluting for a long time. Yep. Why don't we get a chance to pollute for a while and get our economy in better shape, and then we'll, we'll negotiate some uh, reduction in emissions? Because there won't be much world left to negotiate. It's very simple. All right, that's the argument that they... We, no, it's not an argument. It's, it's a reality. No country can solve this problem by itself. Right. No country, if we went to zero emissions tomorrow, we still need China, Russia, India, and all these other countries to be on board. Now, you, you, the argument, I've heard this argument face to face with different ministers and people who say, well, wait a minute, you guys were doing this a long time ago, you've had more years to do it. Yes, but, here's the but, capitalized. It wasn't until 1988 and 1990s, beginning, that this issue suddenly arose and people were aware of what we were doing. And from that point in time, we have made bona fide efforts continually to try to be fair and bring people to the table and spend money and change the dynamic. Until Glasgow, it, the Chinese were saying recently, well, we have a lot of issues with the United States and let's put them all together and we'll resolve all the issues, including climate change. I understand you kind of did some negotiating in Glasgow and you got the Chinese to agree that we'll separate out the climate change issue. Is that fair? Yes. Well, we, we had agreed to separate it out previously, and President Biden and President Xi had talked about it, uh, and that has been our point uh, of view from the very beginning here. This is not an issue, this is not a bilateral issue. This isn't an issue between China and the United States, except to the degree that if one or the other is, is, is uh, continuing the problem, we all have a right to sort of push back. This is a global issue. Every country can do things that make a difference here. I mean, China is about 30% of all the emissions on the planet. The U.S. is about 10% now. And then you have India behind us, the EU, uh, 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 Russia, uh, Indonesia, and, and sequentially down to about 2% uh, and one point something percent of all the emissions. So 20 countries, David, basically the G20, but 20 countries not exclusively G20, account for 80% of all the emissions on the planet. So if you can get those 20 countries to come together and work fast enough, we can really have a profound impact on the choices that other governments are making, i.e., what happens in Africa as they develop. We want them to develop. We want Latin America to develop more. We want South Asia to develop more. But we want them to develop clean, smart, that doesn't mean building coal, it means using renewables, moving into new energy, and, and we have to develop further. Battery storage, clean hydrogen, uh, we have to uh, uh, carbon capture, which could make an enormous difference in utilization of that carbon for one product or another. So there's a lot of research being done, but not even enough research being done at this point in time. At Glasgow, they say, wait a second, you have all this, these incentives, but you're not getting them through the Congress, so why should we listen to you? The infrastructure bill, which President Biden proposed and has passed and signed into law, has in it major initiatives to deal with the global crisis. Now, in the Build Back Better legislation, a large part of it was incentives for people to convert to uh, more um, energy, um, I'd say efficient kinds of uh, way of getting things done and, and renewables and so forth, tax incentives, a whole variety of things. I think maybe $500 billion of total yeah. value. Right. Um, that legislation stalled now. So what do people say to you at Glasgow? They say, wait a second, you have all this, these incentives, but you're not getting them through the Congress, so 
Why should we listen to you? Well, there are people who ask that question. No question about it. Uh, <laughs> I've heard it. Uh, the fact is that the infrastructure bill, which President Biden proposed and has passed and signed into law, has in it major initiatives to deal with planet, with the, with the global crisis. And, and so, for instance, building charging stations around the nation, helping with incentives for the conversion to a, a, a electric vehicles, uh, building out a grid in America, a smart grid with transmission and so forth. There's about, I think it's about 60, 70 billion dollars in there for that. So there are major steps that are already passed. And I know the president is going to continue to try to fight for the best parts of what he thinks he could get through on uh, what was Build Back Better. I don't know if it'll be that or something else, okay. but we need that. We need that for the planet. It's not just uh, what we do in America will matter enormously to what happens in many other parts of the world. So um, let's say um, I'm a country that is in Glasgow and I'm sitting down with you privately and I say, I know you're, you have the, the best of intentions and the president has the best of intentions, but Donald Trump's popularity seems to be still high. He could get elected again, so why should I listen to you? Because we could go through this whole thing about the United States pulling out of these agreements again. Do you have that question? I don't believe I've had that question, sure. Uh, but I, I, I believe, and I think you'll agree with me, there is no way any president down the road, and I believe President Biden, is, you know, he's got three more years, and then I think he could be elected and reelected, will be because of what he's achieved. And, and once we get beyond COVID, once we see uh, this transition between, be, be, uh, you know, taking hold, our economy is doing pretty well. Right. And, and the unemployment is very low. So a lot of the uncertainty right now revolves around COVID right. uh, and a few other things. But, but let me just say this. No president in the future would walk into the White House and undo what is going on around the world. This is bigger than the United States, what is this response. People all around the world are retooling. Here in America, do you think Ford Motor Company and General Motors, which have completely retooled and are retooling their factories to build electric, you think they're suddenly gonna say, no, electric's not the future? Electric is the future for automobiles all around the world. That's already happening. The pace at which right. electric is in demand and being built, why is Tesla highest valued company in the world. And all it produces is electric cars and electric vehicles. So I think that no, with the trillions of dollars that are going into clean hydrogen, into batteries and battery storage, carbon capture, while companies all around the world, and you know this, David, you, you sit on boards, you've been a CEO, there are boardrooms all around the planet in which the discussion is about ESG, environment, social, and governance. People are concerned about being responsible. The finance sector is going to demand disclosure of risk. So people are going to be making risk judgments about the kinds of investments that are being made. And, and I think uh, I don't see any politician anywhere in the world undoing what is happening in the private sector today. And that's going to continue. It's going to grow far above what it is today. Let's suppose I say to you, I agree with what you're saying, but actually I'm not that able to impact climate change. I'm just a capitalist. I want to be an investor. Am I going to be able to make money by investing in this climate change economy or am I going to lose money? You're going to be able to make money, but it's going to happen. Uh, and, and there are a lot of people already investing in it and making money. I know right. people in certain parts of the world, they'll remain nameless but they're invested to the tune of billions of dollars in alternative renewable energy, and they're deploying it around the world. It is cheaper to do that than it is to build a coal plant, than to buy the coal. It's cheaper than it is for fossil fuel today. And if, if, if people did the real accounting, which they don't do, the real cost of fossil fuel ought to contain the damage to the atmosphere, the damage to the planet, the warming of the ocean, the black lung disease, the health effects. I mean, the real cost of this is way beyond what's factored in at the pump or anywhere else. And you know that. So because there are subsidies, we have about two and a half trillion dollars of subsidies built into the system. Last year, there was about $440 billion of subsidies. To what? To fossil fuel, which is causing the problem. That doesn't make sense, David. And so I think that uh, you're going to see a sea change. Look at what happened in ExxonMobil. 
three seats on the board of directors have gone to people who have been active, caring about climate, and it's changed what that company is thinking about and doing with respect to it. So you obviously are passionate about this subject, I assume, be fair to say, right? Well, I'm passionate about it because I think, because okay. the, 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 the the negatives that will come with ignoring this further are so identifiable. It's almost like the vaccination issue. I don't want to get into it too deeply, but when 99% of the people dying are unvaccinated and 97% of the people going to the hospital are unvaccinated, you get a message from that. Well, it's about the same thing here. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars cleaning up the mess after a storm that we might have been better off preventing in the first place. And if, if the, all the literature is clear, all the economic analysis is clear, it will cost us far more not to take action than it costs to take action. So common sense says, let's, let's get to work. You came to Washington in 1985 uh, as a senator. Uh, how is Washington different than 1985? Is it? It's Night like and day. Because then there was bipartisanship to some extent? Well, there was, uh, to more than some extent. I mean, uh, I can remember we'd get together in the, in, in the city uh, on a given night and, and we'd have Republicans and Democrats at the table and eat dinner and laugh and tell jokes and do some business too. And the next day you could come into the Senate and build on what had happened. That doesn't happen Why uh, do you think that's changed? What, what, what well, you... a lot of reasons, David, uh, not the least of which is the amount of money it takes to run for office in America now. It's, it's uh, huge amounts of money, and there's a perennial, there's a constant process of having to get on an airplane and go raise money. So as you look at your incredible career in public service, uh, what would you say you're most proud of having achieved so far? Uh, I've never stopped. I, I, I can't even begin to answer that. I mean, I'm proud that, uh, you know, for 28 years I had the privilege of representing Massachusetts and we did some very exciting things uh, with uh, health care and children and uh, the Foreign Relations Committee, ending a war with Vietnam with John McCain. Uh, he and I worked hard on POW MIA to try to put the Vietnam War to bed, really, and to do it the right way by answering the questions families had about the missing in action and prisoners. Uh, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of keeping faith with, uh, with combatants in, in that effort. I mean, there are many things. I, I think the Iran nuclear agreement was one of the strongest nuclear agreements uh, in history. This is the good deal that we have sought. And tragically, uh, the president pulled out of that, and now you see where we are. Uh, Iran is back, uh, the nuclear weapon is threatening again, and we're in a far more dangerous world as a result of what he did. So I'm proud of what we did on that agreement. and. Uh, uh, you know, I'm proud of the Paris Agreement and the Glasgow Agreement. We emerged from Glasgow having dramatically raised the world's ambition to solve this challenge in this decade and beyond. Those, I think, are perhaps, the, if we look at where we're heading and what we need to do, among the most important things any of us could have done. So as you look back on your career, you, no regrets you didn't go into private equity, investment banking, something important like that? <laughs> well, life would be easier and different, probably. But uh, no, I, I've loved every minute of what I've done, and I, and, you know, who knows? Maybe there's still time to do some of that. So you have eight grandchildren with your blended family. Uh, what do they call you? A secretary or or a special envoy, or what do they call you? <laughs> uh, depends what mood they're in, but mostly grandpa. Okay. Mostly I am uh, I'm grandpa, uh, unless I'm words I can't even begin to describe. You don't tell them about climate change very much? They're not that focused on it? or No, they're not that focused, happily.